Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so today is the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And as you may know or may not know, this name for Mary came about when apparitions starting in 1531 to a young Mexican peasant man, Juan, uh, happened. Numerous, numerous apparitions happened. And when Mary first appeared to him, she spoke in his first language in Aztec. And the apparition that shows up on his cloak in the end has many symbols in it that would have been of the understanding and cosmology of that culture. And she wanted him to build a chapel in her honor. Now I'm going to put something out there about this feast day that offers a new imaginative insight into that, into her feast day, into her presence. And generally speaking, with that apparition and with the way the miraculous chapel happened, uh, you know, it was during a time when the Spanish had conquered that area. So it was a Spanish empire that was ruling and the Mexicans were not ruling and the Aztecs were not ruling. It's generally assumed that Mary appeared to Juan and the context, the understanding of it all is housed within Catholicism. But what if it wasn't? What if that wasn't Mary's intention? What if when this divine feminine presence that appeared, that seemed to bridge the cultures, there are, there are elements that were Catholic, there were elements that were Aztec. What if her intention was different than that? What if the, the cloak that had Aztec symbolism wasn't about getting Aztecs to be more on board with conversion, but was rather a sign and a cloak that was a bridge to bring understanding and respect for both paths. And there are many more paths than just those two in the area, but those were the dominant two. What if? What if? And what if it was just our cultural lens at the time, because the Spanish are ruling, everything's looked at from that vantage point, he is commissioned to go to the bishop to get the church built. So it's lining up logically that, of course, this is a Catholic thing that's happening. But what if the intentionality of this divine presence was more to be a bridge to the reigning empire, to bring respect to the Aztec traditions as well? Because the only recount we get is through the ruling eyes and the, the, the records and the, the, the attitudes of the time. And I'm not purporting that that's the case. But our only interpretation of those events comes only through the reigning empire. It's only through those accounts. It's only through those eyes that we see that event. On the fourth apparition, uh, Juan, he, she kept asking Juan to come back and Juan's uncle had fallen ill and he was going, he was Catholic. He was going to get a priest, his uncle with confession. And she found him. She intercepted him because he was trying to avoid her because he had to get to his uncle. And she says something that's in his language. That's very beautiful. She says, no estoy yo aquí que soy tu madre. Am I not here, I who am your mother? And now that itself is a very mysterious statement, isn't it? Because it could mean anything, really. It could mean, 
you can't avoid B. You it it could mean so many things. It was a gentle invitation into an experience of the divine presence in this form of Mary. And she healed his uncle right on the spot, and he didn't even need to, to go there. One of the intentionality of those miracles was to be a bridge of peace between two cultures, one that was being oppressed and one that was ruling. What if? What if? What if? If we wish to open ourselves to the divine presence in ourselves, in, in understanding what our attitudes and perspectives need to be in the world, these questions are good questions. Because in every culture where you've got these miraculous happenings, and I'm very familiar with the Catholic ones, but there are miraculous happenings and apparitions in, in many, many, many traditions, if not all of them. But they're interpreted within the lens, it, within the lens of the religion itself. What if the apparitions are meant to soften the boundaries of those religious attitudes, to key into where the real power is? I mean, Juan himself was a bridge. He was Aztec. His first language was Aztec. He was converted to Catholicism. Who knows how? Who knows why? Who knows whether it was willing or pressured? But he is himself a bridge. And I believe that he represents each one of us. We are a bridge, each one of us of many different cultures of many different attitudes, and we have our predominant ones. What if each one of us, because of the miraculous things that happen within ourselves, are called to be a bridge and bring a, a new religion? I want to read a poem by an Israeli poet, one moment, mm -hmm. that shines a light on this. So I'm not sure I can pronounce his name right, but Yehuda... Amichai, and he is considered one of Israeli's greatest poets. And this poem, it'll be in the newsletter, is translated uh, by Chana Bloch and Stephen Mitchell. And Stephen Mitchell is uh, pretty well known in our spirituality circles. He's involved in a lot of translations. He has a beautiful book on Quan Yin, beautiful. So here is his poem that shines a light on this topic today. An Arab shepherd is searching for his goat on Mount Zion. And on the opposite hill, I am searching for my little boy. An Arab shepherd and a Jewish father, both in their temporary failure. Our two voices met above the sultan's pool in the valley between us. Neither of us wants the boy or the goat to get caught in the wheels of the Hadgaya machine, Gadja machine. Afterward, we found them among the bushes, and our voices came back inside us, laughing and crying. Searching for a goat or for a child has always been the beginning of a new religion in these mountains. I want to add a little bit more breadth to what we're talking about here. These words are from the Dalai Lama. He's speaking to people of uh, a lot of different backgrounds in this talk. I always say that every person on this earth has the freedom to practice or not practice religion. It is all right to do either. But once you accept religion, it is extremely important to be able to focus your mind on it 
and sincerely practice the teachings in your daily life. All of us can see that we tend to indulge in religious favoritism by saying, I belong to this or that religion, rather than making effort to control our agitated minds. This misuse of religion due to our disturbed minds also sometimes creates problems. I know a physicist from Chile who told me that it is not appropriate for a scientist to be biased towards science because of his love and passion for it. I am a Buddhist practitioner and have a lot of faith and respect in the teachings of the Buddha. However, if I mix up my love for and attachment to Buddhism, then my mind shall be biased towards it. A biased mind which never sees the complete picture cannot grasp reality. And any action that results from such a state of mind will not be in tune with reality. These are very very insightful words. And you see the way it, it calls us out of, out of our biases, out of our structures, out of even maybe we position ourselves as in something, out of something, for something, against something. It pulls us into what we, we could playfully say is a new religion. And what if Mary was doing that? What if her presence and her apparition at that time? What if it was a power play by divinity to get the reigning empire and the reigning religion to wake up and look at the other cultures in their areas as being just as valuable? It wasn't interpreted that way, was it? But what if? And what if we looked at the apparition of Mary in that way now? What if we took that poem that, that shines such a light on the universal search for safety for the people we love and the things we love as a unifying principle that's worthy of creating a religion around? What if we took the words of, of the Dalai Lama that, that pulls back the distorted ways that we tend to speak of religion. And we let ourselves be moved by the essential practices we choose to be the construct of our spirituality that may or may not be within the house of a defined religion. What if, what if, an enlightened mind, the Buddha says, sees reality for what it is. A distorted mind cannot grasp reality. And some might say that the times we are in globally now are treacherous and terrifying. Some might say this is just the repetition of another cycle of terror. Regardless, if world peace is something that is alive in you as it is in me, we're called to something quite severe, and that is to begin to allow our distorted minds to be healed. So today's short meditation practice is about that, and we're going to let Our Lady of Guadalupe, we're going to use the imagination, because the imagination is such a powerful tool that's underestimated in our spiritual practice. It, it can feel or seem less grounded. But the imagination, I believe, opens us up to the existence of grace outside of the time element, outside of the space element. We're going to let Our Lady of Guadalupe come to us in this moment, this moment. 
So I invite you to close your eyes. And become aware that as we sit together today in this moment, whether this moment is 7, 17 a.m., whether this moment is 10 p.m., whether this moment is in the year 2030, we sit together in spirit. And allow yourself to use your imagination to envision that we sit in circle, that we, however many the we is, are sitting in circle, a peace circle. We sit in circle being the bridge the bridge of our own backgrounds and enculturation, bridge into the spirituality that we claim is ours today, the bridge into peace that the many diverse expressions in the world may not result in division, but may result in celebration of diversity. In this, open your awareness that each one of us, in the energy that we are, create together in this circle, a circle of vibrant light. And this energy moves around the circle. And as it moves around the circle, through our hearts, through our hands, through our mind. We let that light intentionally come to heal the distortions in our own minds. Imagine the light moving around the circle and washing through our minds, washing through our minds to enlighten us today. I invite you in the silence of your own sitting in this moment to invite in guides, loved ones, angels, shamans, beings of all realms that are beings of peace. And then use your sensing or your imagination to 
to become aware of Mary in whatever form, Our Lady of Guadalupe or some other form, to be standing in the center of our circle. If this divine presence is the mother of all, wouldn't that divine maternity stand for unity among all humans and seek to be a bridge, an actual bridge to that? We become aware of this presence. And in this silence, where you sit, how you sit right now, let yourself converse with her. And as you converse with or without words with her, see her coming towards you and taking from her garment a vial of very sacred, sacred oil. Oil that has been used for healing of mind for many, 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 many centuries. And see her open the vial and pour some of the oil upon her fingertips. And she raises those fingertips to touch the center of your forehead, your third eye. and open yourself in this anointed healing that the distortions in your own mind may be healed. That you may see reality for what it is and have the courage to stand in that vision alone.
And Mary then hands you this vial so that you may be the custodian of the healing of the distortion of the collective mind. And in this, we bring our short time of meditation and contemplation to a close. You can allow yourself to remain in the presence of Mary and Mary in the presence of you. Or you can allow her to, to disappear. But before opening your eyes, make an intention today. I invite you of a way you're going to open your mind in a new way to be healed. When you're ready, draw your palms together in front of your heart and open your eyes with Namaste. Namaste.